Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about the Ralph Hurwitz Stability Criterion. So what we're going to see here is that the Ralph Hurwitz Stability Criterion is a interesting mathematical procedure that's going to allow us to assess if any roots of a given linear polynomial are in the right half plane. So this has obvious applications of control systems engineering because we know that the characteristic equation for most, uh, actually for all linear time invariant systems, those are linear polynomials, right? And its roots determine the stability uh, and performance and characteristics of the system. Traditionally, Ralph Hurwitz stability criterion typically arises uh, in the context of root locus. So if you've been watching some of our previous videos on root locus, you know that we've developed some tools to sketch what the root locus might look like for a given system as we vary this parameter k from zero to infinity. This gives us an idea of where the poles are going to go, but if you notice, we didn't actually determine a way to calculate what is the critical value of k that will lead to one or more poles going into the right half plane. So we're going to see that this is exactly what Ralph Hurwitz is going to allow us to do. It's going to give us a convenient way to determine what value of k is going to yield instability. And actually, since we're talking about this, I've actually got a math joke that uh, is, is kind of on topic here. So there was a plane, actually, it was leaving Warsaw, uh, Poland, and it was coming back to Seattle, Washington in the United States here. So as such, the entire plane here, maybe let's sketch the plane here. I'll draw the fuselage kind of in an exaggerated fashion here. But the plane was exactly made up with 50% um, Polish citizens and 50% U.S. citizens. And for some reason, all of the Polish people decided to sit on the port side of the aircraft and all the Americans stat on the starboard. So the plane's flying along here and it's starting to come into Seattle here and as it's starting to come into the airport, some of the Americans look out their window and they notice that there's some orca whales circling around a ferry boat and they start talking about themselves and they're excited and they start taking pictures and selfies with these, uh, these orcas out the window. Now, one of the Polish citizens overhears and sees all this commotions and decides to go over to investigate what was going on. And as soon as he did that, the plane experienced severe lateral instabilities and, and, and depending on, on the version of the story you'll hear is the plane spiraled and crashed into the ground. I like to think that the pilot was able to recover here, but long story short, what's the moral of this story here, right? You have to keep all of your poles <laughs> in the left half plane, right? <laughs> Okay, um, anyway, so uh, with that being said, why don't we go ahead and start talking about uh, Ralph Hurwitz stability criterion. Okay, so let's assume that you've got some kind of characteristic equation uh, of your system here given by, uh, let's just use general terms, a n s to the n plus a n minus 1 s to the n minus 1 plus yada 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 all the way down to a 1 s plus an a zero right this is equal to zero right so here's your polynomial right and what we want to do is we want to understand are any of the roots of this polynomial in the right half plane but we don't want to actually have to go and explicitly calculate what are the roots here right because we know as as you get a larger n this can be kind of onerous here if you don't have a numerical tool here what we want to do here is Ralph Hurwitz is actually a procedure that will allow us to look at the coefficients of these polynomials, build what's called a Ralph array here, and then determine how many of the roots here are in the right half plane. So the procedure here to do this here is, um, it, it's fairly algorithmic actually, so I kind of like it in that sense. So let's talk about the procedure. Procedure to determine number of roots in the right half plane. Okay, so procedure here. Let's talk about step one. So step one here is all you got to do is first build an empty Ralph array here, which is really a, uh, a matrix. Build an empty, let's say, empty Ralph array. Okay, so what this thing here is it will have the number of rows is going to be just n plus one. So the order of the polynomial plus one, that's how many rows you have. And the number of columns is going to be given by the ceiling function of n plus one over two. Okay, so 
All you got to do here is build an empty matrix. And maybe let's start building this empty matrix kind of over here on the, on the right here. So you just build this empty array here where you have n rows. And let's call it h. Let's assign this a variable. Let's have a call it h for the number of columns. So you have then h columns. OK. OK. And then step two is you just fill in the first two rows of that matrix here using the coefficients. OK. So I'll write step two is fill in first two rows. OK. So the way you do this, it's, it's really simple here. Um, if n is odd, Right, the first two rows are going to look like this. It's all, all you do is you follow this zigzag pattern where you take the coefficients of s in descending order and you just kind of follow this pattern here. So a n a n minus one, a n minus two, a n minus three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right, and you'll end up with uh, a one and an a zero. That's if n is uh, is odd. Okay. Now if n is even, it's it's the same thing. You follow this zigzaggy pattern here. A n minus 1, a n minus 2, a n minus 3, yada, yada, yada. But you'll end up with a 0 here. And then you just stick a 0 down here. Okay. So again, the easiest way to think about this, I like to think graphically, right? It's just you take the coefficients of n, you follow this zigzaggy pattern, right? In both cases, you just follow the zigzag pattern of dropping in the coefficients here. And then if you run out of coefficients, just tack in a zero at the last entry. OK, OK. So now once you have step one and two done here, uh, what we can do here is move on to step three. So step three is really where you build the rest of the Ralph array here. So I'll just write build rest of the array. OK, and uh, tell you what, you know what we actually let me erase this. We really don't need this empty matrix. We're going to go through an example here in a second. So that might be better than me trying to generalize this here. Now, the thing that's interesting about this here is uh, for the remaining columns, you follow this algorithmic procedure here. So to, to denote this, maybe let's just go ahead and I'm going to say you're again, you have n rows. OK. Let's say that you're working on, say, the kth row here. So you're going to start entering in these things. So you've got, obviously, column 1, column 2, all the way up to column H. OK? So let's say that you happen to be on, say, row K, column I. OK? So let's say right here, this is the entry you're interested in filling in. Why don't I call this Z? K I for row K column I. OK, um, what I want to do also is let's call the row right above it. Let's call this row uh, Y here. So Y, this is is row K minus one. OK, and then the row what one above it, let's call it X. So this is K minus two. So you, you see to compute the value at row K, you're going to use entries from the two rows above it here. OK. And um, OK, maybe to make our life easier, uh, let's call this maybe x1, right? Because it's in the x row column 1. Here's x2 all the way down to xh, right? And then in the y row, let's call this y1, y2, all the way down to yh, OK? OK, so to compute this entry here, zki, right? So zki. What this is, is it is kind of a piecewise thing. The easy thing to do here is the last column here, it's always 0. So if i is equal to h, it's always 0. However, all these intermediate rows here, or sorry, intermediate columns here, will be um, this formula here. So it is y1 times xi plus 1 minus x1 times yi plus 1 all over y1. So this here is if i is in the range of 1 to h minus 1. So maybe let me, let me scoot this over so it's all lined up. OK, so again, this last column here, these are always zeros. 
so that's easy. It's just these intermediate ones. When i is between 1 and 1 less than the last column here, you use this funny formula here. And if you stare at this thing long enough, let me, let's me let identify what some of those entries are. Maybe I'll circle them in red here. So you use uh, y1, which is the row exactly above it, but it's the first column. So you're always going to use this one, right? And then you use xi plus 1. So if you're on row i, you're actually using the entry um, 1 to the right. So this would be xi plus 1. That's, that's this one up here. Oh, oh sorry. I, 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 sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I circled the wrong one. <laughs> sorry. I, I should have written a... Uh, yikes. xi plus 1. Right? And here's y... I plus one. Okay, and I guess I didn't draw this thing super nicely, but maybe if I try to just to keep the columns uh, straight. Okay, so you're using this one up here, right? So it's two rows above and one column over, okay? That's these two terms. Then minus this product here of x1. So then you're using this here and then yi plus 1, so that's this one right here, and then you're dividing by y1, okay? So what's interesting about this here is if you look at this long enough here, this looks like it basically makes a figure 8 pattern here. So let's, let's, let's trace this out. I, again, I like to think about this graphically here. So here's y1 going up to xi plus 1, and then back to x1, and then back to yi plus 1, and then you divide through by the denominator of y1 here. So it makes this figure 8 pattern starting from this location. So you always kind of make this figure 8 pattern, and interestingly, you always use the far left column here. So you see there's a y1, x1, and y1. You always stay here. But as you march along the indexes of the columns, as you start going over in the columns and filling this out, the, the right side of this figure eight pattern moves along with you here, right? Um, so maybe, maybe let's write that down because I think that's a little bit helpful to kind of make a note here. So note here that when you're filling out this array here, um, uh, it constantly uses the first column. Constantly uses first column. So if you want to think about this in the figure 8 pattern here, again, the left side of the figure 8 is constant. It doesn't move, right? Um, uh, what else is interesting? Oh, I, I guess the, uh, the, the right side of the column does move here, right, of the figure 8 pattern here. So uh, the right side of the figure 8 moves uh, with the columns, right? So as you start computing columns, and then finally, the last thing we always want to note here is that the last column here is always zero here. So the last column is zero, okay? All right, so great. Uh, again, step three is the is is the where the meat of the work comes in here. But you can see it's very algorithmic here. Okay. Okay. And then once we have this, maybe we can write step four is pretty darn easy here. Maybe we've got enough room down here. Step four is all you're going to do here is you're just going to isolate the first column and count the number of sign changes S I G N that show up here. So count sign changes in column one, right? So the number of times or the number of sign changes there are, this is going to basically tell you the number of roots of the polynomial that have a positive real part here. So this is number of roots of polynomial with positive real part. In other words, the number of ones that are unstable, right? That's going to tell you uh, how, to, how, many, how many are in the right half plane. So why don't we do this? Let's uh, pause the video. I'll erase the board. And let's go through an example of building this uh, array for a actual concrete polynomial just so we can see the pattern and how this works. All right. Uh, give me a second here. 
All right, let's go ahead and look at an example here. And how about, let's look at an example of a six order polynomial. Okay, so the one I wanna consider here, let's look at a characteristic equation that looks something like a 2s to the six plus 4s to the fifth plus 2s to the fourth plus, no, sorry, excuse me, minus, minus uh, s to the third plus 2s minus two equals zero here, right? So we can obviously see here that the uh, relevant coefficients here, right? We have an a6, which is two, an a5, which is four, an a4, which is two, an a3, which is actually minus one here, and an a2 of uh, zero actually, right? There's actually no s squared term here, but that's really a, a, a zero s squared. Okay, and then we have an a1 of two, and then an a0 of uh, minus two. Great. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So first step we said, right, was step one was the empty array. So just get the structure or the size of this thing correct here. So we said the number of rows is gonna be n plus one. So this is gonna be six plus one. So there's gonna be seven rows here. The number of columns here is gonna be this ceiling function here of n plus one over two. So this is, this is ceiling of uh, six plus one over two, which is just what ceiling of seven over two, which is 3.5. So the ceiling surrounding that thing up is four, right? So there will be seven rows and four columns. So maybe let's come over here and let's just build ourselves a seven by four array. Okay. So maybe I'll use a different color to kind of delineate the inner entries here. So we got four columns and we said seven rows, right? Okay, so two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so there we go, all right? There's our uh, empty array. Okay, so now let's go ahead and uh, step two, fill out all of the, um, the first two rows. So step two is first two rows. Right, so all we gotta do is follow the zigzaggy pattern here. So we gotta go, um, what, two, four, two, minus one, zero, two, minus two. And then we end up with that situation where I need to pad this thing with an extra zero here because n is, n is uh, even here, right? Okay, so there's our first two rows. And now all we gotta do here is just start going through step three for every single subsequent entry here. So uh, tell you, let, let, let's keep all that up here. All right, so step three is just fill in the array, right? Using our good old friend here, uh, we said, let me just write it up again. So ZKI is going to be, it's either Y1 XI plus one minus X1 Y I plus one all over Y1, or this is if, the column you're considering is not the last column here, right? And then it's zero otherwise. So let's just tackle this again. That's the easiest thing. We, we know the entire last column here is gonna be zero. So I'm just gonna fill that out right now. Zero, 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 zero. Great, okay. So let's just go real slowly for maybe one or two of these rows here, uh, just so we can make sure we're all on the same page, okay? So let's look at how about row three. So you always start kind of uh, top to bottom here, okay? So row three, let's compute this entry here, right? This entry right here, row three, column one. So I'm really computing Z31, right? So in this case, uh, I, I guess we should have been explicit here. Z31, this is uh, K is equal to three and i is equal to one, right? It's row three, column one, okay? So just start plugging this in. So z31 is going to be y1 times x1 plus one minus x1, y1 plus one all over y1, right? So this is really y1 x2 minus x1 y2 all over y1, 
Okay, so again, if we just look at this from our little zigzaggy pattern, it is, we're currently on this row K here, right? So here we have K is equal to three. So one row above it, this is what we call the, um, uh, sorry, that was the, uh, the Y row, right? And then the one right above that was the X row, okay? So I just gotta go ahead and plug this in. So let's just quickly identify which entries matter in here. So we're, we're sitting right here. So this is the, the entry we're trying to compute, okay? Now I need to look at Y1, the one right above it. So I need this one. And then I need times x2, that's this one, and then this one, and then this one. So again, we see the nice figure eight pattern shows up, okay? So this is just going to be, in this case, it's four times two minus two times negative one all over four, right? Okay, great. So, uh, do, 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 do. Let me make sure I got you. Four, two, two, one, oh, four. Okay, great. So you crunch all these numbers here, and I think you end up with uh, five halves. Great. Okay, so this entry right here is five halves. Okay, let's do another one. Um, let's go to the next column. Okay, or sorry, yes, the next column. So let me just increment this. So now I want column number two. So now I want Z32, right? So K is equal to three, I is equal to two. All right, so all I gotta do is just change all these here. So this is now a two and a two, okay? Uh, so this becomes three and y three, right? So again, let's just, uh, let's clean up our, our, our picture here and then identify which one of the, of the entries matter here. And I think you're gonna just see that all that happens is the right side of this of this um, figure eight pattern is just going to move over. Okay, all right, so I think that's, I think that's fairly clean here. Let me just clean this up a little bit. Okay, so now we're computing this entry right here, right? This is Z32 here. So I need, again, we said the left side of the figure eight stays the same. So I still need this entry but then I need X3, so I need this entry, and then this entry, and then this entry. So the figure eight pattern stays the same, it's just the right side of it moved over here, right? Okay, so, oh, sorry, hold on, let me shut off this ringer here. Um, okay, so let's see, what we end up here with is, uh, what, it is four times zero minus two times two all over four. Right, that's Z32. Okay, great, and if you crunch these numbers here, you end up with a minus one, okay? So here we go, this entry now is just minus one. Okay, let's do one last one just so, we're ex so we, we get it completely down here. Let's move on to now this entry. K equals three, I is equal to three here. Okay, so I want that entry. Let's go ahead and erase everything here so we can start from a nice clean slate. Yeah, I wish there was a, I wish there was a better way to do this, but uh, I guess not. Unless I did this digitally, maybe. And that, that's maybe what we should have done, is I should have had some scheme where I could digitally put this up here, but uh, okay. Let me, let me clean this up. Okay, all right, so I want this entry here. All right, so to do that, let's come back over here. I'm rolling a row three, column three. So I want Z three, three. So that means K is equal to three, I is equal to three here. So I just need to update my indexing for all of these. So it's so not too bad, four, four. Okay, so again, if you, I, if you look at which patterns matter here, or which entries matter, it's the same thing. It's this entry, this entry, this entry, and this entry, right? So again, same thing, figure eight. Pattern, 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 like that, right? Okay, so writing this down here, what do we got? This is four times negative two minus two times zero all over four, right? That's our last entry here. Uh, and this is a negative two, okay? All right, great. So we're set. There we go. 
And now all you gotta do is now that we finish this row, we're gonna move down one. So let's do one entry just so that we all see what's going on. So let me go ahead and uh, let me just erase this because we're gonna start another row. Things might be a little bit different, okay? So uh, again, let's, let's, let's clean everything up here. Boy, I wonder if it's faster. I just erase everything. I just rewrite it. Maybe, maybe that's a quicker way to do this here. Or I should have had my little magnets or something, something that I could move around quickly without having to erase all this. Ah, uh, yikes. <laughs> Sorry, this is looking a little ugly. Yuck, yuck. Okay, yeah, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> let me clean this thing up a little bit here. Okay. What were these entries up here? Uh, okay, so this was 2, 2, 0, negative 2, 4, this was a negative 1, 2, 0. Okay, there we go. All right, okay, so now what we're doing is we're dropping down to row 4, okay? So what we gotta do is we gotta shift this entire thing down here, okay? So now the K entry is right here. So here's K. And then the row right above it is Y, and the row one above that is X. Okay? So let's go ahead and compute this entry right here. Right? So I want row four, column one. Okay? So I'm looking for Z41. Right? Okay, so Z41, right? That is going to be uh, Y1, X. 1 plus 1 again, minus x1, y1 plus 1, all over y1, right? So this is actually uh, y1, x2, minus x1, y2, all over y1, right? So again, you look at this, and, and, and I th this is getting boring at this point, right? Because you see that it's this, 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 and again, here's your figure 8 pattern, that just shows up. So just plugging in those numbers here, we end up with, uh, do, 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 what is this? This is five halves uh, times a negative one minus four times negative one all over five halves. Right, okay, and you, you crunch those numbers and you get three fifths, right? Okay, so at this point, I think everyone has seen enough of this here. So uh, if you really want to, you can work all this out yourself, but maybe take my word for it that I'm just going to skip all of the other. You don't want to watch me fill in all these other <laughs> entries because it gets really, really repetitive, right? So let me just fill it out. I think you end up at the end of the day, this is going to be uh, 26 fifths, zero, and then you get minus 22.67, negative two, zero, then you get 5.1, uh, five, zero, zero, negative two, zero, zero. Okay, so here's your Ralph array, okay? Let me erase all these reds just so everything looks consistent. Okay, so this is the entire array, and you know what, it would be nice if we can check this somehow, and you saw here how, how mechanical and how methodical this is, so hopefully, What's going off in the back of your head is, man, I should, I should automate this, right? There's no reason I should be doing this manually like some kind of idiot. I should have some routine that would go ahead and do this. Surprisingly, it doesn't appear like uh, I couldn't find a built-in MATLAB function that does the Ralph array. But you look at this, it's, it's, it's like an if statement here, right? It's a double for loop where you just go through this entire matrix and then every single entry you just evaluate this expression. Right, so I've actually got a link to, um, I'll, I'll provide a link to a function that I made called RalphArray.m. It's a MATLAB function that you basically give it the polynomial coefficients. It will do this for you and kick out uh, uh, the Ralph array. So let's run over to MATLAB real quick. I'll just show you how to, how to run the function. We'll just double check to make sure that this looks reasonable before proceeding. All right, so here we are in MATLAB. Let's go ahead and verify uh, the Ralph array using a custom MATLAB function called, uh, this is what I called it, Ralph Array. So again, I will provide a, um, a link to where you can download this function for yourself here. It's in the description of this video. So let's go do a real quick uh, help Ralph Array. And uh, again, like I said, this is something I just wrote up myself. I actually surprisingly couldn't find it uh, built into MATLAB in the control system toolbox. Maybe it's already there. Let me know if you know where it is. If you Google for Ralph Array in MATLAB, you'll find a lot of 
people's implementations of this algorithm here on MATLAB Central here. So I thought I would give you one of these uh, as well. So again, all you got to do for this is let's start out with our clear CLC close all like we do with all scripts here. But let's just go ahead and, head, ahead and define the polynomial first. And like we said, you do this like we do all other polynomials in MATLAB. You give it the coefficients of s in descending order. So I think in our case, that was 2, 4, 2, minus 1, 0, 2, minus 2. Right? Before we do this, you know what might be interesting? Let's go ahead and check what are the roots of this polynomial. Polynomial. Okay, so I'm just going to say roots p. And again, this is what we're trying to avoid. I don't want to have to make this call to, to, to line 10 because that might be computationally intensive or it might be difficult to do analytically as we're going to see uh, later on. But for now, for illustrative purposes, let's just run this. Okay, and we see that uh, here, look at this. There's actually three poles in the right half plane in this case. Okay, so now what I want to do is let's go ahead and create the Ralph array for this polynomial okay and we did that on the board but I want to check our work here um and go ahead and pass this thing P and I'm gonna this is gonna return an array let's call it just R how about okay so if I run this guy here's the Ralph array and I think that's actually exactly uh, what we had on the board so good this looks great so, tell you what, why don't we jump back to the board now that we verified that the Ralph array we calculated is correct. Let's go back to the whiteboard and go on to step four and see if the Ralph array would also predict that, yes, there should be three roots in the right half plane uh, for this system. Okay, so we saw that this was correct. So, now in order to f finish the process, step four is we basically just want to isolate the first column here, right, and count the number of sine changes right so if we just look here at the first column of the Ralph array we start from top to bottom here and we just look at when the sign ch changes so positive 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 oh po went to negative here so cha sign change one this was when we went from positive three-fifths to negative 22.67 okay so, all right, negative, oh, and then the switch to positive here. So, sign change number two was when we went from negative 22.67 to positive 5.15, okay? And then, look, flips again here. So, then sign change number three is when we went from positive 5.15 to negative two. So, in this case here, we see there are three sign changes. Therefore, there are three poles in the right half plane which is exactly what we saw on the numerical results here. So, great, the Ralph array seemed to, uh, seemed to correctly predict the number of poles in the right half plane. Obviously, it didn't tell us where those poles were, it just tells us that there are three poles that are in the right half plane. Now, this isn't totally foolproof all the time. In fact, tell you what, let's pause the video, I'll erase the board, and let's look at one example of a, maybe an odd special case. Okay, so I'd like to look at an example of a uh, kind of an odd sort of special slash edge case. If, if you're really not interested in this, this is almost more of a little bit of more of a mathematical curiosity of anything, so it doesn't occur too much. Um, so like I said, if you're not terribly interested in this, feel free to just look in the description of this video, find the timestamp for the next uh, section of the video, and just, just jump to that. But if you are interested here, let's look at an example here of a special case. And this is taken from, um, Brian Douglas has a very good video uh, uh, talking about special cases of the Ralph Hurwitz criteria. And I will link to his video in the, in the description of this particular video here. So the case he looked at in this situation was this polynomial here. It was a fourth order. So s to the fourth plus 2s cubed plus 2s squared plus 4s plus 5 is equal to 0. Okay? All right, so um, this guy, if you went over to here to MATLAB or Mathematica, you would see there's actually two poles in the right half plane here. So this thing has two poles in the right half plane. Okay, so let's just keep that in the back of our head that this is kind of what we're looking to see that the Ralph array would be able to predict for us. So let's just go ahead and build our empty uh, Ralph array. So in this case, uh, we would have a system that is five rows by three columns here. So let's just quickly sketch it out here again like we did earlier. 
So there's only three columns in this case. And there's only five rows. So this is two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, all right. And then we can easily go ahead and fill in the uh, first two rows of this using the coefficients of the polynomial in our good zigzaggy order. So we got a one, two, two, four, five. And then we got to pad this thing with a zero again. Okay. All right, and then lastly, uh, let's go fill the rest of these rows. We know the very far right column is just going to be zero, so let's just fill that in. So it's not that bad. There's only six entries we got to compute. So let's just go ahead and start here. So here's the K row. Here is the, uh, I always forget if we, I, th I think this was what we call, yeah, Y and then X, right? The two rows above it. Okay, so let's just go and do this. So let's just go ahead and do Z31, uh, right? And again, just looking at our looking at our, our, our zigzag, our figure eight pattern here, it's going to be two times two minus one times four divided by two, right? So here's our here's our figure eight for this case, All right? I, I want this entry, so I figure eight it right above it, something like that. Okay, so this entry is just going to be. Uh, let me just make sure I don't mess this thing up. So we get. Um, 2 times 2 minus 1 times 4 all over 2, right? And you actually end up with 0. And interestingly, let's just put a quick little star next to it. This is kind of what's causing the problem here. We're going to see later on down the road here that this 0 in the first column is going to cause issues. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why in a second. But let's just go ahead and fill out the rest of the array. So this one, uh, again, not very difficult. It's going to be 2 times 5 time, uh, minus 1 times 0 all over 2. So this entry here, I think you're going to end up with is just 5. Okay. Now, let's look at this entry. Okay. We're going to move down. To row five. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to fill out Z51. Okay, so here's where you're going to have a bit of an issue. Let's maybe do it underneath of this. Okay, so Z51, right? Okay, so in our case, the zigzagging pattern here is, or sorry, I call it zigzag, but it's really a figure eight, right? Okay, so this is going to be what? It's going to be zero times four minus two times five all over zero, right? You see, this is where we have the issue because this first column, if you remember, this is what gets used in the denominator of all of these calculations here, right? So when we got a zero in that first column, this has the potential to really mess things up. This looks like, to me, minus infinity, right? Because you get, you get a negative number on top divided by zero, so this is negative infinity, right? Okay, so this entry apparently is negative infinity, okay? Okay, and now let's go ahead and get the next column. All right, yes, next column. So this entry right here. So I want Z51, uh, 52, right? So Z52. Okay, so the pattern here, it's going to be the figure eight is going to come from here to here to here, here, right? Okay, so this is going to be zero times zero minus two times zero all over zero. Oh crud, this is even worse. Now, th this is not even, in this is a zero over zero. So this is like not a number, right? It's indeterminate, right? So this entry becomes not a number. Okay, <laughs> so let's see if we can kind of continue on blindly. Well, uh, this is gonna cause a little bit of issue here. So let's go ahead and try to get ourselves th this entry. All right, the last row, okay? And I'm gonna quickly erase what I can so we don't get confused with which entries matter for our figure eight. Okay, so now let's get ourselves Z61, okay? So the figure eight here is, and you can see why this is now rapidly uh, devolving into something ridiculous here because now you got minus infinity times five minus zero times not a number <laughs> all over negative infinity like what this this is also not a number right this is indeterminate and i guess we really don't need the rest of these because all i care about is the first column but if you went ahead and computed this here you'd still get not a number 
So I don't know how to interpret sign changes here. I mean, I guess you could call this one sign change, but then what, what, do, what are we going from minus infinity to, to not a number? I, I don't know what, what the sign change was there, right? So the problem stemmed for this, from this fact here, where, we, where when we computed an entry and we got a zero, okay? So the way to, we, to, to, to deal with this here is, let's go ahead and erase some of this, is as soon as we get that zero, instead of putting in zero, we should use a very small number like epsilon instead, okay? So the solution here, or the workaround here is when you compute a zero, when zero computed in uh, first column, uh, replace with epsilon. Okay, which again is a is a, a very small positive number. Okay, so let's go back ourselves up. So let's go ahead. I'm going to erase all this. We're going to back all the way up to our row three calculation. Okay, so let's back up to this entry here. All right. Okay. So we computed this to be zero, but instead of using zero, we're going to now use epsilon. Right. And I guess this still would have been five. Right. Okay. Now, let's try to use this as we compute row four, okay? So now let's look at Z41 using epsilon instead. So now I am looking at Z41, okay? So the pattern there now is our figure eight is now using epsilon instead, okay? So we end up with epsilon times four minus two times five all over epsilon, right? Okay, so now what do we end up with here? So now this actually, uh, again, looks like negative infinity to me, right? Because this is, this is going to be, uh, basically, this is 0 minus 10. So this is like a negative, like basically it's negative 10 in the top over something tiny, positive. So this, yeah, blow, goes to negative infinity, okay? So we end up with negative infinity, okay? Now let's look at the next entry, Z42. Okay, so now Z42 is going to be, it's going to be what? It's going to be epsilon times zero, right? Minus two times zero all over epsilon, right? So, uh, okay, so zero in the numerator over something small, this is basically zero, okay? All right, so now we get a zero here. Great, okay, now let's move down to the last row, okay? And get ourselves Z51. Okay, so I'm, and I'm trying to get this entry here. So the figure eight looks like that. So we got negative infinity times five minus epsilon times zero all over negative infinity. Right? So this is basically, this is effectively zero. So we basically get minus five times infinity over negative infinity here. So I guess you could, the negatives cancel. So you can call that a positive. The infinity is effectively, can, the, the top grows five times faster than the bottom. So if I take the limit of this here, this is basically five, right? So great, we end up with five here, okay? And then heck, for giggles, let's go ahead and just finish out the array here. So Z52 is going to be now negative infinity times zero minus epsilon times zero all over negative infinity. Right? Uh, wait, is it five? So this is, uh, uh, yes, okay. So the top is just a zero over negative infinity. Okay, great, so we just get zero, right? Great. So in this case, this ended up working because now if I count the sign changes going down here, it's positive, 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 Negative, that's one sign change, and then going from negative back to positive, that's the second sign change. So there's two sign changes. So two right half plane poles. Great, which actually checked out, all right? Okay, great. So now that I think we have a good way to, to look at how to compute the Ralph array, let's talk about the applications of this to root locus. Okay, so let's see how Ralph Hurwitz can be applied uh, to root locus. So remember here that with root locus, let's go ahead and consider our standard system where we've got a normal open loop plant, we're going to call it G of S, and then we're going to use our classical root locus feedback architecture like such, and we're interested in looking at where do the closed loop poles of the system go as K goes from zero to infinity. So for giggles, let's just pick some 
close loop or some open loop transfer function. We'll make this thing really easy. How about an S plus one, S plus two, S plus three? Okay, so that's pretty darn simple. Um, and if you remember from our last discussion here on root locus and sketching this, we saw that, okay, you can go ahead and plot this thing on the real imaginary axis. We can look at the open loop poles. We got something uh, here, here, and here, right here at minus one, minus two, minus three. And then we know that the valid regions of the root locus are something like to the left of the odd number pole. So it's something like here and then here. And then we know that there are angles of asymptotes here at 60, 180, and 300 degrees. And it's probably centered somewhere in this region. So I bet, you know, this thing, these two poles must come together and come off like such. All right. So this is probably what the root locus looks like for this system here, right? Now, what we want to ask here, though, is, all right, it's great that we can sketch this here, but we want to know what K value leads to instability, right? It's clear from this root locus that if you push this system too hard, if you jack K enough, you're eventually going to push these two poles to the right half plane. What K value actually does that here, right? This is where Ralph Hurwitz is going to allow us to answer that question, right? So let's just go ahead and compute what is the closed loop characteristic equation. Right? Well, that's pretty easy. I think you remember from our last discussion that the closed loop transfer function for this whole thing, right? If you use some block diagram algebra, that's just kg over 1 plus kg. So the characteristic equation here was going to be 1 plus kg of s, right? Or another alternative formulation we saw of this was that if you went ahead and said that g of s was a numerator polynomial over a denominator polynomial, Right? We showed in one of our earlier le uh, lectures that you can basically do some algebraic manipulations on this and you could write this thing as B of S plus K A of S, right? So just plugging in the relevant values for A and B, what you'd end up with here is a closed loop characteristic equation that looks like S cubed plus 6S squared plus 11S plus 6 plus K. So here's the characteristic equation, or if we want to look at this from a purely sterile math perspective, right? This is a linear polynomial here where you have an A3 of 1, an A2 of 6, an A1 of 11, and then an A0 of 6 plus k, right? So here we go. It's just a polynomial with linear coefficients. Let's just go ahead and create a Routh array of this, okay? So the corresponding Routh array... Okay, in this case, we see n is 3, so that means there's going to be n plus 1 rows, so we're going to have 4 rows. And in this case, it's actually going to be really simple. It's only going to be 2 columns. Okay, so let's just go ahead and fill in the first 2 uh, rows using the zigzagging pattern of these coefficients. So we end up with a 1, 6, 11, 6 plus k. Right? Okay, so now uh, what else can we do? We can fill in now the, le the rightmost column with zeros. So this is awesome. There's only two entries to figure out. So we got to just figure out this entry right here, right? So let's go ahead and get ourselves Z31, which was according to our figure eight pattern. It's just these entries that matter. So it's just going to be six times 11 minus one times six plus K all over six right okay so i think if you smash this all down this turns out to be just 60 minus k over six all right so this entry is just 60 minus k over six perfect uh okay moving on now to this entry down here all right so i need now z what is that five one okay so z no, sorry, Z41, Z41. Okay, let's just draw ourselves our little pattern of where it matters. It's this, 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 something along those lines. So those are the entries that matter. Um, so it is 60 minus K over six times six plus K minus six times zero all over 60 minus K over six, right? And if you do that algebra, this thing comes down to uh, 6 plus k 
Okay, great. So now at this point, we've filled out the Routh array, 6 plus k. Okay? So what we're looking for in this situation is we got to figure out where is there going to be a sign change, right? Because as soon as there's a sign change, we know that that is the value of k, which is going to lead this going over to the right half plane. So positive, positive. So we got to figure out when is this entry negative here, right? So if we figure that out, let me just write it down that we see that, okay, there's going to be a sign change when 60 minus k over 6 is less than 0 here, right? Okay, so, uh, well, that's pretty easy. So 60 minus k, I can just multiply by 6 because it's a positive number. That doesn't change the sign of the inequality. So we see that basically when k is greater than 60, we have a problem here, right? So according to the Ralph Hurwitz criteria, it's actually going to be here, right? We're going to, is, is one potential location where we have uh, a, a sign change here, right? Um, the other thing we should probably be careful of here, though, is let's assume that this is positive. Is there an, another, like, what if this was positive, positive, positive? There's still another possibility here that uh, this entry could could turn could flip negative here, right? So here's one condition. The other case, like, maybe we should call this case one. Case two, or possibly number two, is when six plus k is, uh, we need, sorry, when this turns negative, right? Less than zero. Right? So in this case, we see that when k is less than negative 6, we also have a problem here. Right? So we are not really considering this case here um, because if you remember in our root locus discussion, we are only considering positive values of k. I want to know what values of k from 0 to positive infinity are going to lead to a problem. This might lead to a problem here if we were allowing ourselves to have negative values here. Right? But in our situation this is the one of greater interest here so k is equal to 60. so why don't we go over to matlab here and let's just quickly do this in r in, using the r locus command you remember we had a video talking about how to numerically compute the root locus here using matlab and let's just verify that this k of 60 is the proper value all right so here we are back in matlab tell you what let's just go ahead and uh, suppress the output for some of these since we're not concerned about uh, that example anymore and instead what we want to do here is look at uh, root locus, right? So let's go ahead and create the transfer function g that we talked about earlier, and I'm going to use zpk. So we said there were no zeros, and the poles were at minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and the gain for that transfer function was 1. So the open loop transfer function was just zpk of z, p, and k. There we go. So here's our open loop transfer function. Yep, that looks about right. Now let's just go ahead and uh, plot the root locus. So I'm going to say figure r locus of of g go ahead and run this guy again and i will pull over the root locus and here's what it looks like and what we can do now is like we saw earlier is i can just click on the root locus and drag and let's look at the gain so yes as the gain increases we're at three four five six you can see we're getting closer and closer to instability closer and closer and eventually here we go it's still negative but if i touch it a little there we go look at that our calculation was exactly correct right a gain of k equals to 60 gets me uh an unstable or a neutrally stable system so that looks great let's jump back over to the whiteboard here and talk about generalizing this approach now Okay, let's see if we can just generalize this now uh, for any polynomial, right? Instead of using specific polynomials with specific constants, why don't we just use uh, variables for the coefficients and see if there are restrictions on the coefficients directly at the polynomial level so we don't even have to build this Roth array in the future here. And we're going to see this is very easy to do here with, um, with, uh, with lower order polynomials here. So again, let's go ahead and consider ourselves our polynomial, right? We said it was looking like this, a to the n, s to the n, plus a n minus 1 s to the n minus 1 plus yada 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 plus a 1 s plus a 0 is equal to 0 okay so for this discussion here what I want to do is I want to just consider what are the co co the restrictions on these coefficients a n uh, to that might yield instability so one thing to note here let's assume without a loss of generality that the highest order coefficient this a n is positive Okay, and you see that's very easy to do here, right? If you had a negative here, 
uh, for example, what if you had a negative 3s squared plus 2s plus 4 is equal to 0, right? Well, the, this polynomial, since it's equal to 0, I can just multiply everything by negative 1 to get this to look like 3s squared minus 2s minus 4 is equal to 0. It's the exact same polynomial here, right, from a roots perspective here. And now you see that in every single situation, there's never a case where you can never, where you would not be able to make the coefficient of the highest power s equal, uh, greater than 1, or make it positive here, okay? So let's just make this assumption now and go through the rest of our analysis with this, okay? So what we're going to see here is let's let's start simple. Let's consider a second order polynomial. And actually tell you what, I'm going to do it over here because I want to keep some room. Okay, so second order polynomial. Okay, so in other words, I want to just consider something, let's call it a, a P2 for the second order, right? This thing just looks like an A2S squared plus an A1S plus an A0. Okay, where are the roots of this thing directly? Okay, so I don't, let's compute the Ralph array. We're only going to do it one time, so we're not going to have to do this more in the future is the idea here. So we see that this thing just has uh, three rows and two columns, right? This is actually pretty simple. Okay, so first two rows here, we're going to do our little zigzagging of A2, A1, A0, and then uh, pad this thing with a 0. The last column is always a 0 here at the far right. So there, yeah, there's, there's one entry to compute here. I just need to compute this entry here at Z31. Okay, so here's the pattern right above it here. So we see that in this case, uh, this entry here, actually, you know, we can just directly compute it. Well, let's just, let's just do it over here, right? So Z31... This is just going to be a1 times a0 minus a2 times 0 all over a1, right? So this is goes away, and then the a1 gets... So, yikes, this is interesting. This only comes out to an a0. <laughs> so, fascinating. So the Ralph array in this case, here it is, right? Okay, so now, if you look at this, let's look at the first column. We know that a... 2 is greater than 0, right? That was the assumption we made right here. The highest order coefficient is always positive here. So in order for this to have 0 sign changes, right, that means that A1 and A2 both also have to be 0. So we need A1 and A0 to both be positive here, right, in order for there, for there to be no... Um, in order for there to be no poles in the right half plane. So this is interesting. For a second order polynomial, you don't even have to compute the Roth array at all, right? All you do here is you just make sure that you you manipulate it so that the um, uh, the highest order coefficient is positive. And then all you got to do is check two things, right? You check that the, the A1 and is, is positive and the A0 coefficient is positive. That's literally all you have to do here, right? So... Uh, maybe just to be explicit about this, uh, I, I guess maybe in a, to avoid rewriting, I can just say, um, I guess A2 is greater than zero, right? So here are sort of the three conditions that are needed here, but this you kind of get automatically as per this assumption. Maybe we should call this, let's call this assumption A.1, just so we can keep referring to this here. So you automatically get this here. This is automatically true per... A.1. So really there's two checks you do here, right? There's you only check the A1 and the A0 coefficient here for uh, that they're both positive. Okay, great. Let's move on to a third order polynomial here, okay? So let's go ahead and erase everything and see if there's a similar or if there's other kind of uh, restrictions on the coefficients if you had a third order polynomial, okay? So maybe let me uh, keep some of this up and I'll erase the rest of it here. We are now moving our way on to a third order polynomial, so let's call this a P3, and the only difference now, well, I guess I should scoot the whole thing over. Now yeah, let's do it again here. So right now it's A3S cubed plus A2S squared plus A1S plus A0. Okay, so again, the corresponding Roth array here is now, now we got uh, four rows. So it's a little more work here, but not much. Four rows and two columns. Okay, so fill this guy out. We got A3, A2, A1, A0, and then these far right columns are zero. So really there's two entries to compute here, right? So let's go ahead and again get ourselves Z3 or 1 using this 
entry of our figure eight. So we have uh, Z31, right? This guy is just going to be um, A2, A1 minus A3, A0 all over A2, right? Okay, great. Uh, all right, maybe it's going to take a little bit, but we can we can fill this in. Okay, so this is a two a one minus a three a zero all over a two. Okay, great. Okay, now let's just get our last entry in the Ralph array down here. The figure eight that's necessary for this is this. Right. Okay, all uh, right, so let's go ahead and compute that right now. So Z41, right? Uh, what is that? Z41, oh gosh, that's ugliness here, huh? It's, it's a little bit ugly. But uh, if you simplify it, I wish I wrote it down here. I, I, I totally had it down, and now where did I put it here? Oh, here, okay. Um, to avoid, to, to make this a little easier, let's call this entry, I don't know, let's call this, this entry, how about B1? I'm going to refer to this as just B1 here, just so I don't have to keep writing this. So this is B1 times A0 minus A2 times 0 all over B1, right? Where B1 is this, this ugly thing here, right? This is, right? So you symbolically manipulate this, you put in B1, and surprisingly, this thing smashes down to something very, very simple here. This just turns out to be A0. Great! So our Roth array is actually not so sh not too bad. Okay? So here's our corresponding Roth array for a any third order polynomial here. So let's go through the exact same analysis here, right? So uh, as per assumption A.1, right? This thing right here, we know that A3 is positive, right? That means we better make sure every other entry is positive here, right? So we see that, okay, A2 has got to be positive. So does A0. This has to be positive, okay? And this thing has to be positive. We need this quantity A2, A1 minus A3, A0 all over A2. This better be positive, right? So we need all three of these to be true simultaneously um, in order for this thing to have no poles on the right half plane. Let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. Um, if this is true, right, let's assume that A2 is greater than zero. I can now multiply both sides by A2 and not change the sign of this, this is inequality, right? So let's just say if A2 is greater than zero, then this becomes, what do we end up with? We end up with A2, A1 minus A3, A0 is greater than zero, or A2, A1 has got to be greater than A3, A0, okay? So traditionally what you'll see is these are the conditions, the ones that we're boxing up here, right? Again, this, this is sort of like implicit, yeah, this automatically happens, or, or, or it's, it's easy to satisfy this. You can always make this true, but I guess if you really want to be conservative, maybe these are the minimal set of, uh, of checks you need to make in order to uh, ensure that you have no poles on the right half plane. So basically, check that uh, these coefficients are positive and that this weird combination of coefficients is, is, is true here. Interestingly here, if you note here, there's no restriction on... A1, right? This could be anything <laughs> here. Um, so some texts you'll see a restriction. They're also going to claim that A1 has to be Z, has to be positive. That's not explicitly true here, but you can see what we can show that this happens automatically or is a consequence of these other uh, conditions being satisfied here. So in other words, this is not a necessary condition here for having uh, all left half plane poles. This is uh, a byproduct of actually a combination of this and this. And I guess if you really want to see that here, let's go ahead and examine this inequality here, right? So if you examine A2, A1 has got to be greater than A3, A0 here, okay? If you assume, let's go ahead and assume that this is satisfied here, right? We assume that A2 is greater than zero. So if that's true here, right? So if 
A2 is greater than zero, right? I can divide through on both sides and we end up with A1 is greater than A3, A0 all over uh, A2, right? And now you see here that again, if A3 is greater than zero, a0 is greater than 0 and A2 is greater than 0. This whole thing has got to be greater than 0. Therefore, A1 has got to be greater than 0. So again, the way to think about this is that all of these box conditions, those imply that A1 is positive here as well. But it's not necessary here, right? So this is not, uh, th this again, I like to think of it as a byproduct here. So really, you don't even have to check A1 here, right? If you check these box conditions here, you'll be fine. There's no need to check A1. A1 will automatically be positive, but it wasn't even required in the first place. Okay, great. That's a good discussion here on second order polynomials. Let's bump this up a notch here and go to, uh, oh, sorry, that was, wait a second. What did I do here? Third, no, that was third order polynomials. Yeah, third order polynomials. Yeah, let's, let's go up a notch and go up to our fourth order polynomial here. All right, so moving on to uh, a P4 or a fourth order polynomial. So now I got an A4s to the 4 plus A3s cubed plus an A2s squared plus an A1s plus an A0 here, right? Okay, so in this case, again, let's fill out our Routh array. And in this case, we see that now we're going to have five rows here. So two, three, four, five. We're actually going to have three columns. Like this, and sorry, actually, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. And now, um, again, let's fill this guy out. So we got A4, A3, A2, A1, A0, and then pad this guy with a 0, and then make all of the left, uh, rightmost entries 0 here. So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 entries to compute here. So let's just go ahead and get started. So working on this first Z31 entry, uh, Z31. Okay, that's uh, actually, you know what, that's exactly the same thing we computed earlier. It's the same pattern here. So this is uh, A3, A2 minus A4, A1 all over A3. Okay, so that's just something complicated. Again, let's call this maybe B1, just so we don't have to like write all of this information in here. So this I'm going to call B1. Okay. All right, so then moving on to uh, Z32. Okay, that is going to be uh, a3, a0 minus a4 times 0 all over a3. So that's interesting. This turns out to just be a0. Good, so this entry is pretty easy, a0. Okay, let's move on down to the uh, fourth row. So z41, right? That is going to be, uh, what is it, b1, a1 minus a3, b2, all over b1. Uh, wait, sorry. Uh, it's, I, I guess I, I called this b2. <laughs> I was calling this row b1, b2. Um, just in my notes here. But uh, okay, so if you plug all this in here and you do the math here, let me see, this guy uh, comes out to be something actually kind of ugly here. Um, this is a4, a1 squared plus A0, A3 squared minus A1, A2, A3 all over A1, A4 minus A2, A3. Again, something ugly. Let's call this maybe C1. That's that entry right there. Is this, is this ugly term, okay? All right, and then uh, Z... 4, 2, right? The 4, 2 entry here, that is um, B1 times 0, right? Minus A3 times 0 all over B1, right? Right, which is, uh, lucky for us, a big fat 0. Good, so this entry is actually pretty simple. That's 0, okay? And then let's just get our last entry here, the last row. So, moving on to the last row, Z51, right? So Z51, that is going to be C1 times B2 minus B1 times 0, right? All over C1, right? Okay, so that's actually, actually, oh wait, this goes away, this goes away. So this is just B2, 
right? Which I think we said was just a zero. Okay, good. So this is actually really easy here, right? So this last entry here is just a zero. Great. And uh, sorry, what did I, where was C1? Oh yeah, C1, this was the ugly term, right? This was ugly. And what was B1? B1 was quasi ugly. Kind of ugly. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, I guess we lost our last, uh, again, th th who cares about this last one, right? Nobody cares about this last entry, but if you really wanted to compute it, you totally can. Here, maybe for completeness, let's do it here. Z52 um, is, uh, what the, what the, uh, where did I have this thing? Um, well, I guess we can compute it ourselves here. So it's, uh, it's C1 times zero minus zero times, what is it? Zero times B1, right? all over C1, right? So this is just a, just a zero. Okay, good. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, great. Okay, so it's just these entries. So these things are were, were the kind of ugly terms here. So let's maybe quickly, let's rewrite them here over on the side just so we all have them in one concise location here. Okay, so this B1 term, right? That's what we computed earlier. It was the same thing as, uh, I guess we called it Z31 here. That thing was, um, this thing was A3, uh, yeah, where's A3, A2 minus A4, A1 all over A3, right? And then that other term C1, this was the, the, the massively ugly one, uh, which was, um, A4, A1 squared plus A0, A3 squared minus A1, A2, A3 all over a1, a4 minus a2, a3. Great, okay, so that's our first column. So again, let's do the, do the same analysis we did earlier. We know here that a4 is gonna be greater than zero here, right? As per assumption a.1, right? So we gotta make sure the rest of this column stays positive. So right off the bat, we see that, okay, a3 has gotta be zero, as well as a0 has gotta be zero, right? This entry and this entry have to be, have to be, sorry, positive. They're gonna be greater than zero. Then we just have to deal with these two kind of ugly in this ugly term here. So we know this has to be, has to be positive. We know this has gotta be greater than zero, okay? And now we can play the same games here that if this is true, right? So again, let's, uh, no, I'll box these up in, in a second, right? If A3 is true, I can just, mul well, actually, yeah, I can multiply both sides without changing the sign. So we end up with this restriction effectively turns into A3, A2 has got to be greater than A4, A1, right? Let me just make sure I got that right. Uh, yeah, A2, A3, A1, yeah, good, okay. That's what this turns into, okay? Now this ugly thing down here, let's go ahead and say, whoops, sorry. This has to be positive as well, right? This entire term C1, this entry has to be greater than zero, okay? So let's just do a little bit of manipulation here. Um, again, uh, this term here, uh, do, 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 do. okay, we gotta look at this in, in, in conjunction with what we just did up here. If you notice here, this denominator is basically, let, let, let's, let's rewrite this, right? Okay, let's rewrite this. This is, uh, this is A3, A2 minus A4, A1 has gotta be greater than zero, right? So we're assuming this is true here, right? This is another one of the conditions here. If this is true, look at, look at the denominators, right? The denominator looks really similar to this, it's just flipped it's a negative, right, of one another. So in other words, it's a minus one. So meaning if this is positive, this denominator has to be negative or is, is less than zero. So if I multiply both sides by this, I need to change the sign, the S-I-G-N of the inequality here, right? So what I'm gonna say here is let's do this implication that if we assume that A3, A2 minus A4, A1 is greater than zero, what this means for this inequality is that I can rewrite this guy as a4, a1 squared plus a0, a3 squared, 
minus a1, a2, a3 has got to be actually less than zero, right? Again, because we're being very careful about the sign, right? This denominator is the negative of this condition here, right? Okay, so if that's true, let's just move this to the other side and we sort of end up with our last um, condition here. So we end up with a4, a1 squared plus a0, a3 squared. It's got to be less than a1, a2, a3. Great, so let's box this up. This combined with this combined with these three. Those are the conditions here for a fourth order polynomial to have all the poles in the left half plane here. So again, that's interesting if you, if you examine this, there's no restrictions on A1 and A2, but I bet it's got, you know, it's, it's kind of buried in here. I don't want to suss it out anymore. I think it's easier just to leave it here with, again, check this. I, I, I get, again, you don't really need to check the highest order. You can always make this true, right? There's, there's never a condition where this is not satisfied. However, once this is satisfied, you need to then check that A3 is greater than zero. You need to check that A0 is greater than zero. Then you have to compute this weird inequality and the combination of components to see if they're greater than zero. And similarly, you got to do the same for, for that even weirder condition here, right? Um, okay, so tell you what, maybe what we should do is let's summarize all of these. Uh, since, since we were floating these around here, maybe it would behoove us to quickly summarize what are the conditions for these different levels of polynomials? Because um, it's very handy in the future when you want to say maybe just look at any given polynomial like something in a root locus and look at conditions here, right? Okay, so what we ended up with here was maybe a nice summary end of this whole Ralph Hurwitz discussion here is if we look at this from a sterile mathematics perspective here, right? If you look at a, let's look at a second order system. So in other words, we said P2 of S, some polynomial that look like an A2S squared plus an A1S plus A0 is equal to zero, right? So you had to check or the conditions that are needed or necessary for a left half plane or for stability here is a2 has got to be greater than zero, A1 has got to be greater than zero, and then A2 has got to be, uh, whoops, sorry, A0 has got to be greater than or equal to zero here. And again, maybe we should maybe just make a quick note that this is automatically true. Or maybe another way to think about it is you can always satisfy that check here, right? Okay, that was a second order polynomial. How about a third order? Okay, so if you had a P3 now, right, which was A3S squared plus an A2, uh, sorry, A3S cubed plus an A2S squared plus an A1S plus A0, you need to then check a couple of things here. You need to check here that A3 is greater than zero, A2 is greater than zero. Nobody cares about A1. I'll just write it right here. I'll just say no restrictions. And an A0 is greater than zero. And then you got to check this weird combination here of A2, A1 is greater than A3, A0. Okay, and again, let's make a note here for the highest order coefficient here that this is automatically true or it can always be made to be true. Okay, then finally we stopped here at the fourth order because you saw how this could, uh, could spiral out of control after this, but the process is the same here, right? So A4 S to the fourth plus an A3S cubed plus an A2S squared plus an A1S plus A0, right? Okay, so in this case, what you had to check to ensure that you had stability here is that um, A4 had to be positive, A3 had to be positive, nobody cares about A2, and nobody cares about A1, no restrictions on this, I guess no direct restrictions here, and then you got to check this weird quantity here of A2, a3 is going to be greater than A1, A4. And then you got to check this even weirder combination of A1, A2, A3 is going to be greater than A4, A1 squared plus A0 times A3 squared. Right? Okay. So here's a nice summary. Oh, sorry. Maybe to be, again, to be completely uh, consistent. Again, you can always make this true. Automatically true. Okay. 
So that's interesting. Let's go ahead now maybe and uh, apply this to that exact same root locus example that we, that we looked at earlier. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at an example and let's use that same root locus problem we looked at earlier. Okay, so if you remember, right, that had a uh, closed loop characteristic equation that looked like s cubed plus 6s squared plus 11s plus 6 plus k. So we see it's a third order polynomial here and I left our little uh, summary of the checks that we need to make here for a third order polynomial up because that's exactly what we want to do. So what we need to do here is just check each one of these. So let's look here. Is a3 greater than zero here? So a3 greater than zero? Question mark. Where's a3? That's, that's here, right? That's one, right? In other words, we're checking is one greater than zero? Yes. Okay, good. So this is a checkbox. We did that. Let's go here for A2. A2, we need to check A2. Is great, that greater than zero? Where's A2? Aha, uh -huh, it's this coefficient. Is six greater than zero? Yes. Great, so this checks out, okay? Nobody gives a rip about A1 here, at least not directly, so I don't even need to bother about that. Let's check for A0. Is A0 greater than zero? question mark. Where's a zero? It's this thing right here. It's six plus k has got to be greater than zero here. When is that true? That is true as long as what? k is greater than negative six. Okay, so let's box this up. Here's one restriction on that value k here. And if you remember, this sort of jived with what we had earlier, right? Okay, so k had better be bigger than minus six in order to this be true. So this is like at a, uh, um, this is check mark, right? if k is greater than negative six here, right? And then finally, let's check this last weirdo combination of coefficients, right? A2, A1, it's gotta be greater than A3, A0, right? Okay, where is A2? So that's six times, uh, what's A1? Uh, six times 11 has gotta be greater than A3, which is one times A0, which was six plus k, right? Okay, so what do we got over here? It's 66 has gotta be greater than 6 plus 6k, right? So, or in other words, 60 has got to be greater than 6k. Okay, so in other words, k had better be less than 60, right? So again, this checks out if k is less than 60, which is exactly what we saw earlier here, right? So this is a little bit more direct way. I didn't even have to build the Ralph array because we already built the Ralph array, and that's how we came up with all of these conditions here. So. Hopefully this is an, uh, uh, a way that will help you now augment your root locus plots because now you can identify which critical values of K will push the system to instability here, right? Um, yeah, so I think it's a pretty handy tool. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion today on Ralph Hurwitz criteria. Um, there's a couple of other additional videos, uh, namely, like I said, by Brian Douglas. He's got a good discussion on digging deeper into the Ralph Hurwitz. I'll link to those in the bottom of this if you're interested. Uh, let me know what you think about this in the, in the comments. And if you do like the video, please like and subscribe it. And I hope to catch you at one of our future discussions. Until then, I'll talk to you later. Bye.